Hi, welcome to a talk on power dividers and combiners. Let's begin with a description of a divider. Here a divider is a three port device. On port one here, we are applying some signal and that signal appears with reduced power on ports two and three. So the signal on ports two and three is the same signal, just each version having one half the power at the input. And that could be accomplished if the divider itself is lossless. Of course, if there's loss in the divider, then these output signals will be less than half power. And that's one of the considerations in a practical device. Now, other things that we would normally like this divider to do is have no reflection, which implies that port one should be matched to whatever it is that's attached to it. Another consideration, at least for this video, is that the port should be in phase. To be clear, there are other visions for how a divider might work. For example, there are some four port devices which can be used to do division. There are other dividers which produce quadrature phase outputs, that is, outputs which are 90 degrees out of phase as opposed to being zero degrees out of phase. Again, not going to address that here. There are dividers which divide the signal in three or four or more ways. There are dividers which produce unequal powers. So for example, 75% of the power goes to one port and 25% of the power goes to another port. There are dividers which are lossy on purpose, which actually has some benefits. We'll see an example of that later in this video. But in general, I'm not going to describe dividers which are uh, intended to address these specific things. Instead, we'll focus on this particular application, and that will give us plenty of uh, material to talk about. Now, a related problem is the combiner. And the combiner is, or could be, the same device. Except now, we apply signals to ports 2 and 3 preferably without reflection. And on port one, we see those two signals simply added together. So that would be an example of a combiner. In this lecture, we're gonna focus on the divider and not so much on the combiner. But what we'll do at each point is we'll ask ourselves, could the divider that we're considering also work as a combiner? And we'll see in some cases it can. So here's the organization of this lecture. We're going to talk about a bunch of divider schemes with increasing sophistication and capability. So first I'll talk about a thing called an unmatched T, the simplest way you can imagine dividing signals. I'll talk about a resistive T, a matched T, and then a quarter wave T. And I should be careful to point out here, that there's no consistent terminology for describing these things. I'm simply going to use my, uh, my own terminology, which I think matches the terminology a lot of other references would use. The last thing I'll talk about is the Wilkinson divider combiner, and uh, that will be kind of the culmination of all the things that uh, I've addressed up to that point. So first, let's talk about the unmatched T. And let me first say that what I'm about to show here is usually a bad idea. I'm showing it because it's the simplest possible thing to do. It can be used, but it's pretty rare that it has an application. So you can imagine coax cables, uh, for example, each of them having a characteristic impedance of Z naught. And one thing we might consider doing is simply connecting them through this thing that I'm calling a T, which is simply a three port device uh, here's a picture of it in terms of a schematic. We simply combine the center conductor on all three uh, ports of the T, and similarly the shield on all three ports of the T. And so this is the simplest possible way to combine these three cables together. In terms of a microstrip circuit, the metallization would look like this, right? We'd have a transmission line uh, at the input and two transmission lines at the output, they all have the same characteristic impedance and they're all joined together at a common point. Now it's gonna be convenient to talk about these things in terms of a simplified schematic. And the simplified schematic that I will use is the one shown here. 
where I do not show the datum, that is the green line on the left, I simply show the uh, signal connections. That would correspond to the center conductor in the coax or the metallization in the microstrip implementation. So now let's get to it and talk about what's actually going on here. First, note that we're talking about characteristic impedance Z0, which is the impedance that we would see looking into the devices attached to this. To see what the primary problem with this device is going to be, uh, consider Z1. Now, if Z0 equals Z1, we have no reflection. And we also have maximum power transfer into the device. So we obviously would like to know what Z1 is. Well, Z1 is simply the parallel combination of uh, Z0 with Z0 because these things are wired in parallel. So Z1 is the parallel combination of Z0 and Z0, which gives you one half Z0. So this is obviously not matched, and it means you get a pretty significant reflection off the input. So this is bad for two reasons. One is you have a reflection, so you have to worry about that in whatever device is attached to the input. But also you have significant power loss. If the point of the divider was to provide an efficient division of power into two ports, well, you've given up some of that power, and not through dissipation, but rather through reflection. I'll also say for future reference, this thing has poor isolation. Isolation refers to the tendency of signals to circulate in undesired directions. So for example, here, a signal uh, on port two ending up at port three, uh, which would make this difficult to use as a combiner. And similarly, a signal from port three ending up at port two, again, would make this difficult to use as a combiner. The next thing we'll consider is a resistive T. Now this thing is lossy, but it has its uses. So let me show you what's going on here. Here's port one, ideally connected to an impedance Z naught. Port two, again, ideally connected to an impedance Z naught. And port three, again, ideally connected to an impedance Z naught. We can solve this reflection problem by, instead of simply directly connecting these things, instead doing it through a T of resistors. And each resistor here has a value Z0 divided by three. You can see that this will fix the problem by calculating the value Z1 looking into the input port. Z1 is simply going to be this impedance, which is one third Z0, plus the parallel combination of these two impedances, and each one of those impedances is an impedance Z0 divided by three plus Z0. So doing the math here, we see that this impedance is four thirds Z0. We get another four thirds Z0. The parallel combination of those two things is two thirds Z0. We add to that one third Z0 and we get Z0. So Z1 equals Z0. This thing is matched at the input and there is no reflection. So this scheme solves a reflection problem. The way this would be implemented in microstrip might look something like this, where you have microstrip lines with characteristic impedance Z0, and they come together at a common point through chip resistors. So those orange rectangles represent the chip resistors, each having a value Z0 divided by three. Now, you can see it's also going to be reflectionless at ports two and three. Uh, this is simply through a symmetry argument. Any exchange of uh, port numbers here gives you the same performance. Now, this looks great. Uh, the downside, of course, is it's lossy, and this is because the resistors dissipate power. Specifically, one half of the power delivered to port one is lost. That is, if you deliver one watt into port one, Port two will see a quarter watt, and port three will see a quarter watt. Yet another way of saying this is that the output ports are 6 dB down, as opposed to 3 dB down, which is what you'd get for lossless division. Now, I'm not deriving this result here about how much power is lost. It's fairly straightforward to do, and I'll trust you to work that out or find a reference that does that if you're really interested. Now this also works as a combiner, but it has, like the previous approach, atrocious isolation. 
Specifically, you can see here that half of the power that I pump into port two, if I'm trying to use this as a combiner, will end up going out port three. In other words, going back to the figure here, half of the power I send in this way will go out port one, which is what I want, but half of it will go out port three, which is what I don't want. So it has horrible isolation. There may be ways you can use this as a combiner if you're okay with that, but it's not normally the best way to go. So to summarize, this scheme works great as a divider if you're okay with the loss. A reason why you might be okay with the loss is maybe you need really, really big bandwidth. The nice thing about resistors is they are frequency independent for the most part. So if you need to divide power over an extraordinarily large bandwidth, uh, this might be the way to go. In terms of a combiner, uh, it's normally not usable. But again, in some cases you might be able to accommodate that or you might have to accommodate a scheme like this. Next, we'll talk about the matched T. Now this thing has some applications, but I'll show you it's easy to do better. This will be the starting point actually for a number of other schemes. So it's useful to know this, even though this might not be the best choice in a lot of cases. So match T is pretty simple idea. We just wire everything together. You might say that's the scheme that we called uh, unmatched T before. Well, the difference here is that we are having in mind when we design it that the output ports are gonna be two Z naught as opposed to Z naught. In order to use this scheme, you would have to be okay with the fact that the input to the divider is at Z naught and the outputs of the divider are at two Z naught. If you're okay with that, this works because now the input impedance is a parallel combination of 2Z0 and 2Z0, which is simply Z0. So again, fine as a divider. As a combiner, not so great. If you're looking in port two, you see Z0 in parallel with 2Z0, which is 2 thirds Z0. So you get reflection when this is used as a combiner. And you still have the poor isolation problem. And this thing has huge bandwidth. There's nothing frequency dependent about this. So the reason you might want to go with this as a divider, even though you have to deal with the Z0 to 2Z0 business, is because the bandwidth is huge. Next, the quarter wave T. And the idea with the quarter wave T is we simply add impedance transformations so that the output impedance can once again be Z0. So in other words, this is the matched T with quarter wave sections, in this case is what we're gonna use. We're gonna use these quarter wave sections to transform to Z0 into Z0. Now to do this, uh, we simply use the fact that the input impedance looking into a quarter wave section is the characteristic impedance of that section squared divided by the termination impedance, which in this case is Z0. So if we solve this equation, for the characteristic impedance of that transmission line, we get square root of two times Z naught. So if we add to each one of the ports of the matched T, a transmission line, which is quarter wavelength at whatever frequency we're interested in, having a characteristic impedance of Z sub C, which is the square root of two times Z naught, then we have everything matched up. All three ports are matched to Z naught. This is the microstrip implementation of that scheme. At the input, again, the transmission line, characteristic impedance, Z0. Output transmission lines, having characteristic impedance, Z0. And in the middle, we have these transmission lines, which have characteristic impedance, which is greater. It's greater by the square root of two, which means the width of the transmission lines is going to be less. So at the input and the output, you have relatively wide transmission lines. In between, we have these narrow transmission lines that are the quarter wave matching sections, and uh, that's all there is to it. So to summarize, the advantage over a match T is that we now have Z naught at all three ports. Disadvantage, of course, is that this is now a narrow band device because these sections have to be quarter wavelength to work properly, and we can only be quarter wavelength at one frequency at a time. Furthermore, this still isn't really very useful as a combiner. Now, once you appreciate all this, there is a very small step that we can take. Namely, we can add a resistor. And if we add a resistor, something amazing happens to the quarter wave T. 
If we add a resistor of value 2Z0, then we end up with something called a Wilkinson divider. And I'll say this is usually the way to go with one caveat, which I'll mention at the end. So the idea in a Wilkinson is that we have the matched T, we have quarter wave matching sections to avoid that Z0 to 2Z0 problem. And then the additional thing is this resistor of value 2Z0 across ports 2 and 3. All we've done here is to add that resistor. That's it. That's the only difference between this and the quarter wave T scheme. So now let me describe what happens when you add that resistor. In normal operation as a divider, the voltage at port 2 and port 3 will be equal. You can see this by looking at the circuit. There's nothing in the circuit that would cause the voltage at ports 2 and port 3 to be different. And if that's true, there's no current through that resistor. If there's no current through that resistor, that resistor might as well be an open circuit. So in normal operations divider, this is essentially the same as the quarter wave T scheme that I showed previously. As combiner, it turns out that the input impedance of ports 2 and 3, that is Z2 and Z3, as I described them earlier, are Z0. So there is no reflection at ports 2 and 3 when I apply signals to them. Also, it turns out no power from port 2 can end up at port 3. Simply by adding this resistor, it turns out that the new design gives me perfect isolation. All the power injected into port 2 will end up at port 1. All the power injected into port 3 will end up at port 1. None of the power injected into ports 2 or 3 end up at ports 3 or 2, respectively. So now you can fairly ask, how do we know this? And what's so special about that resistance to Z0? Well, I'm not going to work that out here. I'll simply ask you to believe me. But it's not too hard to figure out how that comes about. The method you use is this thing called even mode, odd mode analysis. Even mode, odd mode analysis is a method which is very simple, but it's a little bit tedious. It would take half an hour at least for me to walk through how you decompose this thing into equivalent circuits, which represent the even mode and odd mode respectively. And then I could show you how it turns out that we can uh, derive uh, the performance that I've just described. In other words, how it is that I know this to be true. But for what we're doing here, it's fine if you just trust me that this adding this resistor of value 2Z0 will accomplish this thing. And of course, the only change in the microstrip implementation is the addition of that resistor as well. So when you see this, something being split into two quarter wave transmission lines terminated with a resistor uh, 2Z0 across ports 2 and 3, that's a Wilkinson divider. Something interesting here, when you write this out in terms of S parameters, these are three port S parameters, but they work exactly the same as two port S parameters. For example, S11 means the voltage reflection coefficient at port one, and that's zero. And similarly, S22 means the reflection coefficient at port two. S33 is a reflection coefficient at port three. Next, let's consider divider operation. Divider operation is described by S21 and S31. S21 tells you what you're getting at port two relative to port one. S31 describes what you're getting at port three relative to port one. So what you get here is minus J divided by the square root of two. That one over the square root of two shouldn't be surprising. That's just saying it's lossless. That is, it has uh, minus three dB at the output. Uh, it's a 3 dB divider. That J is describing a 90 degree phase shift. That comes from the quarter wave transmission line. So S21 and S31 are the same, of course, because this is symmetrical with respect to ports 2 and 3. That is, ports 2 and 3 can be exchanged and you get the same response. S12 and S13 describe the operation of this thing as a combiner. S12 is what's happening at port 1 relative to port 2, and S13 is what's happening at port 1 relative to port 3. So those values turn out to be the same as what you see in the divider operation. So this thing is working great. What we see is that what is applied to port 2 ends up at port 1. 
And what is applied to port three ends up at port one. And it's in the same manner as what goes in the reverse direction. S23 and S32 describe isolation. And we see that those S parameters are zero, which is a way of saying that there's no power, uh, which is injected into port two that ends up going out port three. And similarly, there's no power injected into port three that ends up coming out port two. So this says we're getting perfect isolation. So this S parameter matrix for this device says that we're getting pretty much everything we could ask for a combiner. You know, except of course, one thing, which is bandwidth. This is only true at the frequency at which those transmission lines are quarter wavelength. So other frequencies, this is obviously going to degrade. And actually there's another thing which is kind of neat about this, and it goes as follows. I've described isolation here as being a problem with combining, but isolation is actually a problem with dividing as well. Consider this, if we have a port mismatch, that is, let's say that the impedance, which is hanging off port two, is not exactly Z naught. Well, then what happens is there's an internal reflection from port two. And that internal reflection from port two looks like something's being injected into port two. Well, we know that what's reflected from port two internally will not end up at port three because we have perfect isolation. When used as a divider, the Wilkinson device is much more tolerant to mismatches at the ports. So in other words, if you end up attaching things which do not have impedance Z0 to ports two and three, uh, you do not significantly degrade the isolation because internal reflections from port two that would normally end up going out port three are isolated. Uh, and things which reflect off port three internally do not end up going out port two. So this is quite a useful feature, and it's not something we've seen in any of the other dividers that we've described previously. So here are some concluding remarks on the Wilkinson device. First, just a reminder, that's narrowband. It's perfect only at the frequency at which the quarter wave T lines are quarter wave. Nevertheless, it has surprisingly large bandwidth. A simple generalization of the Wilkinson device can give you unequal power division. So it's possible to revise the design I just showed you to give you, say, 75% power out port one and 25% power out port two. Not describing that method here, but it is a relatively simple generalization of the technique. Another simple generalization will give you more than two-way division. So you can have a three-way Wilkinson, a four-way Wilkinson, and so on. I did not, in this lecture, explain why this resistor of value 2Z0 makes all this magic happen. Uh, to get the rest of the story, to see exactly why that happens, and to derive it, the method to use would be even odd mode analysis. And um, it's, it's fairly straightforward. It's just a little bit tedious, which is why I didn't show it here. Finally, be careful not to let the resistor branch become a transmission line. So I'll end the lecture with that idea. You have to be careful about how you put that resistor into the device. If the length of that resistor is comparable to a quarter wavelength, as is shown in this picture, then that's a transmission line, and that will muck up the design. So any practical Wilkinson structure will actually look more like this, where you come in with a transmission line and the angle there is very small so that the resistance that you add here is on a path which is very short. And then there are other schemes, of course, where you can minimize that distance, but uh, that's an important consideration. And that's actually one of the things that complicates a Wilkinson design. This concludes this lecture on power dividers and combiners.